I've been working on creating a high-speed platformer, and I'm really happy with how the movement has turned out so far. It's quick, fluid, and responsive, and you have a variety of movement abilities with which you can navigate levels. However, even with solid movement mechanics, there's only so much complexity that can be added to levels with stationary elements. So this past weekend, I decided to embark on what would be one of the most challenging and hilarious endeavors of my game dev journey so far, making stuff move. In a notebook, I had hobbled together a script I thought would result in a nice moving platform. Of course, since I'd done this at work, there was no way to test the code and I couldn't possibly know if it would work until I got home. Of course, it didn't work the first time. So I made some tweaks and revisions until I got the result I wanted. A platform that would fall quickly, wait a moment, then rise a bit slower. After another brief wait, the cycle would repeat. Perfect. The question was, how would my character interact with it? That's where things started to get interesting. Because I'd initially used a character body 2D for the moving block, it inherited the properties of the character body, which meant that standing on top of it would greatly slow its acceleration. In addition, standing underneath it would cause it to get stuck, and subsequently walking back and forth would cause it to move completely out of its intended path. This obviously wasn't what I wanted, so I figured that I was using the wrong body type. The description for the animatable body 2D stated that it wouldn't be affected by external forces, but could be moved manually and would affect other bodies in its path. This sounded like exactly what I wanted, and shortly after changing the node type, I began to see the results I was looking for. It would move up and down on its specified path, and interacting with it would not change its trajectory in any way. However, this also meant that standing between it and the floor would result in being pushed through the floor, since the floor was an immovable object and the block was essentially an unstoppable force. Entertaining as this was, it wasn't the desired interaction, so I began to implement a function which would cause the player to die if they were being crushed by the block. Essentially, if the player was colliding with the floor and the ceiling simultaneously, this would signal to the game that a death had occurred, very much like the classic Sonic games, from which I've derived a lot of inspiration. There was a problem, though. If you walked into the block just as your character could fit between it and the floor, it would kill you, because the game was only checking the floor and ceiling collisions, and not which direction the block was moving. To fix this, I repurposed part of my respawn script to get the nearest object in the moving blocks group and check its velocity. If the block was moving upward, you'd no longer be crushed. So surely all was well after that, right? Well, not remotely. One of the most problematic interactions was my ledge grab mechanic. In fact, it initially seemed like it would be so convoluted to make the ledge grab work with moving objects that I deliberately made it impossible to ledge grab on a moving block. But after a bit of testing, this felt really cheap and it didn't make any logical sense, so I knew it was time to attempt to figure it out. The script for my ledge grab mechanic did some very simple things which caused some very complicated problems. If the conditions for the ledge grab were met, most importantly that a raycast near the player's hand was colliding, while a raycast slightly above the player's hand was not, the game would set the boolean variable ledge grab to true, and the player's y velocity to zero. In my physics process function, having ledge grab set to true disables several functions like applying gravity, handling acceleration, and handling animations. So what happens if you ledge grab on a moving block? Well, you just stay there, forever, until you jump out of the grab. Obviously, this wouldn't do, so I knew that somehow I had to apply the moving block's velocity to the player. It took a lot of tries to figure this out, but the solution I ultimately settled on can be summarized with the following. If the player is ledge grabbing, and they are in a position that is sufficiently close to a moving block, the nearest moving block's velocity is applied to them, under a function I named ledge grab motion. This solution worked perfectly with vertically moving blocks, but for horizontally moving ones, I actually had to accelerate the player into the side of the block they were facing, since the moving block wanted to push them out. After hours of tweaking though, it finally seemed like things were in working order. Of course, that was maybe a bit too optimistic. The following day, I decided to implement the moving blocks as part of the level's actual design, and this uncovered a host of new bugs. To start, being crushed on the ceiling didn't work since the block was moving upward, so I had to write a separate condition in the crush function for if the player's y-coordinate was above the block's y-coordinate. 
Then, I discovered that being pushed out of a ledge grab would cause the player to float, since they were close enough to the block to inherit the block's velocity, despite not grabbing it. I fixed this by only applying the block's velocity if the player's y-coordinates were within a specific range of pixels to indicate that they were hanging onto the ledge, and by causing any collision with the floor to exit the ledge grab. There were also some pretty amusing interactions with the death and respawn mechanic, but these were easy enough to fix by making the death function reset the player's velocity. Oh my god! <laughs> At some point during the hours of tweaking, it dawned on me that I was successfully implementing a mechanic that I had assumed was much too hard for me, and that realization was incredibly satisfying. It also reinforced one of my main philosophies about game design that I've had since the start. I firmly believe that once you learn the basics of assigning and checking variables and manipulating velocities, you already have most of the tools you need to do just about anything you want to do in a platformer. Though my code could accurately be described as spaghetti, and there's probably much more efficient ways to do most of the things I'm doing, the code works, and it works pretty well. For my first game, that's all I care about. On future projects, I'll probably spend a lot more time organizing my code and use state machines and numerous other methods of streamlining my workflow. But for now, I'm just going to keep learning and keep working towards the result I want without getting too caught up in the details. After all this work, I can confidently say that I've implemented moving obstacles in a way that feels good, and I'm pretty proud of the result. The end of the first level easily feels twice as exciting with hazards and moving objects and the way they're incorporated feels fair, and at least somewhat polished. Though I've still got a long way to go, this is the next big hurdle out of the way on my journey to create a fast, exciting, and enjoyable 2D platformer. If you've enjoyed watching the progress on this game so far, please feel free to add Lost Resolve to your Steam wishlist so you can be notified when it's released. I'm extremely grateful for the over 150 of you that have wishlisted it already, and I hope that the final product will be a game that's well worth your time. Thanks so much for following my journey so far. I'll see you guys in the next video.